Thank you very much. <clears throat> a very good afternoon to all of you. And at the outset, I'd like to thank the Scientific Committee of uh, AIOS for this honor. And I truly believe that uh, the foundation of every state is the education of its youth. So I'm very happy to be a part of this program. So I'll take you through intraocular pressure, which is the basic of glaucoma diagnosis and treatment. Raised intraocular pressure is the most important factor for the development and progression of glaucoma, and it is the only treatable factor till date. Uh, target pressure. What is target pressure? It is that pressure at which there is no progression. And target IOP depends on IOP at which damage has occurred, severity of visual field damage, rate of progression of damage, and age and life expectancy of the patient. So when you are to set a target IOP, how much should you reduce it? So in case of ocular hypertensives, it's recommended by the American Academy of Ophthalmology to reduce it to about, say, 20% from the baseline. You have to record a baseline intraocular pressure for every patient that you treat. And from that, you've got to reduce it 20% in case of uh, um, ocular hypertensives. In case of perimetry proven glaucoma, it's recommended 30% or equal to 30% or sometimes even more than 30%. Perimetry proven glaucoma, which is progressing and high IOP, that's 40 to more than 40%. And uh, additional 15% is recommended if your patient is progressing. So intraocular pressure actually has a diurnal variation and we need to understand that well. We have the office IOP where you see your patient one time in a day. We have the random IOP where you can see the patient several times in a day. And research has shown us that there is a great fluctuation between uh, different times of the day. So if you look at that uh, graph out there on the screen, you would see that intraocular pressure fluctuates nocturnally and it is supposed to be highest during sleep. So the intraocular pressure which you record of your patient at the slit lamp at your office is actually the lowest pressure that you are recording. That must be kept in mind. So a 24 hour study in patients known to have progressive glaucoma revealed that the peak measurements were an average five to 12 millimeters uh, during office visits. That's the range where it can actually vary. So when you see a patient, you find the uh, IOP is normal, but your patient is progressing, you must think of a diurnal. Uh, the IOP fluctuation and visual field progression, as you can see those two worms there, they actually ha are directly proportional. The tonometer types, we have the indentation, applanation, pneumatic, non-contact, and contour matching tonometers. Indentation, it's the sheared stonometer. You must have seen it somewhere someday. Uh, we do not use it on regular practice, but still, if you do not have anything, then you can actually use the sheared stonometer. Applanation tonometer, variable force. That's the Goldman applanation tonometer. Perkins, Drager, Mackey-Mark, that's the tonopen, and the pneumotonometer. Variable area, Maclekov tonometer, and we have the non-contact tonometers. They are generally not recommended for regular use or treatment, but then uh, if you have a corneal problem, you could actually use a non-contact tonometer. That's a picture of the Perkins applanation tonometer, and it's very useful for seeing intraocular pressure in children. Uh, just a word, if you're seeing intraocular pressure in a child under uh, anesthesia, the recommended anesthetic is chloral hydrate, halothin ketamine, or endotracheal tube intubation would actually increase your intraocular pressure. Uh, new models of the Makima type tonometer have an internal logic program and automatically select the acceptable IOP, as for example, the tono pen. The tono pen actually compares quite well with the Goldman applanation tonometer. That's the picture of the non-contact tonometer, which uses an air uh, puff to actually take the pressure, but not very reliable in known glaucoma cases. Pneumatic tonometer, useful in eyes with diseased or irregular corneas. Pneumotonometer and tonopen can measure intraocular pressure through bandage contact lenses. And tonopen compared favorably with GAT, as I just told you. But the current gold standard for intraocular pressure measurement is the Goldman applanation tonometer. It makes a static measurement of the force required to flatten a fixed area of the cornea. Goldman and Schmidt, the inventors, actually acknowledged that a variation in central corneal thickness would actually influence the intraocular pressure readings. 
But however, in the absence of corneal pathology, CCT did not vary much more than around 520 microns. So Eller and co-workers showed that a variation of 5 millimeters of mercury per 70 micron of central corneal thickness in normal corneas is the standard recommended by the uh, American Academy. And the, uh, the extremes of underestimation and overestimation of intraocular uh, pressure actually spans, as I told you, almost over 12 millimeters of mercury is quite a wide range. Thus, the Goldman Applanation Tonometer determines IOP indirectly by measuring the force required to flatten or applanate the cornea. Uh, the Goldman Applanation Tonometer is theoretically accurate for a CCT, central corneal thickness of 520 micron. Applanation tonometry on thin corneas, therefore, would mean underestimation of IOP, and similarly, thick corneas would mean overestimation of IOP. You've got to keep that in mind and several uh, logarithms have been given for correcting this. Measuring the intraocular pressure with the Goldman Applanation Tonometer, you need to give a surface anesthesia. Fluorescent sodium is a prerequisite to correctly measure the intraocular pressure and you use the cobalt blue light in your uh, slit lamp. Slit lamp illumination arm positioned at an angle to the observation arm and bring it close to the eye till it touches the corneal surface. And that's where uh, you have a biprism. As you see in the picture there, uh, I have put that picture at the background so that you know you can actually appreciate that the biprism that is within the tonometer splits the image seen in two semicircular rings, just like the rings that you see out here. Height of the slit lamp is raised or lowered so that the semicircles are equal in size. It must be like this, absolutely equal in size. Dial on the side of the tonometer, the screw out there, you just fix it at one and then adjust, is, adjust it away from yourself and uh, this causes a movement of the rings towards each other and the correct area is uh, applanated when the inner edges of the semicircles touch so that's where the inner edges of the semicircles touch and a better uh, picture of this is uh, this that's the end point where you can see the two myers the inner part of the two myers actually meet and that multiplied by 10 would give you the applanation reading. Uh, central corneal thickness, as I told you, it's uh, around 520 microns and uh, thick and thin corneas, you actually have to minus or add according to what it is. That's the graph which shows that about 5 millimeters for every 70 microns, that is the calculation. And this CCT story has actually made us realize the fact that after using Goldman applanation for almost half a century, we actually need to correct it for the CCT. So the old order changeth, yielding place to the new. And today, what came with a lot of hope, but actually has died down, is the dynamic contour tonometer. That's a digital tonometer that provides a direct transcorneal measurement of intraocular pressure and is sensitive enough to detect the ocular pulse amplitude as well that it's a slit, slit lamp mounted instrument as you see out there and the IOP is recorded here in a digital fashion but uh, we used it, it came into the market almost four years back and we used it for a couple of years but it has these disposable caps which the company could not provide so uh, at the moment is actually out of use because uh, the caps could not be provided by the company otherwise it's uh, quite a reliable tonometer to use uh, where you have you know patients with lesic or any kind of corneal problems next we have the ocular response analyzer uh, you all know about it the first iop value is an estimated goldman uh, applanation value and corresponds to the iop value at the first applanation point in the ORA waveform and the second IOP is the CCT corrected one and it is reliable and I suppose uh, this is the tonometer that you could look at maybe after a uh, Goldman applanation tonometer. But what I'd like to actually impress on you today is that if you have a look at that graph, it has 7,756 7, graphs as you see out here and if you notice the uh, peak of this is almost the trough of this. So what does that indicate? That actually indicates that intraocular pressure is very variable. It changes over time. And when you're seeing intraocular pressure, <coughs> you must keep in mind that you could be seeing it now. It could substantially change in the evening or morning. So you must keep that range in your mind when you're treating the patient. 
Another thing which influences intraocular pressure are our thoughts and emotions and can change quickly by a lot. So whatever tools you use, intraocular pressure is best to keep it to a range than to keep it to a number. That is actually what intraocular pressure is. So that finishes intraocular pressure. I'll next move on to gonioscopy. So gonioscopy is the uh, clinical technique to visualize the uh, anterior chamber angle. It was coined by Tantras in 1907. Uh, Salzman introduced the gonio lens. Copy 1919 improved and made this lens steeper and Goldman actually is the Goldman prism which we use, 1938. So if you look at that, direct visualization of the angle is not possible in the normal eye because the critical angle of the cornea to the air interface is about 46 degrees which you cannot see normally. So light rays from the angle exceed the critical angle and there's total internal reflection. Direct gonioscopy, there, uh, this, uh, as you see out there, direct gonioscopy, steeply convex lens. You've got to use that and the anterior curvature such that the critical angle is not reached and the light rays are refracted at the contact lens interface. So in indirect gonioscopy, which is more common and which is what we do, the, it uses a mirror to overcome the total internal reflection. The mirror redirects the light rays coming from the angle and after reflection, the light rays leave the lens at nearly about 90 degrees to the contact lens air interface. So the indications of gonioscopy, essentially for management choices, you must know whether you're treating a closed angle or an open angle. You need to prepare a patient for dilatation. It's ideal to do a gonioscopy and then dilate your patient to avoid any uh, other catastrophes. And various conditions of the retina actually need dilatation. So you need to do a gonioscopy before that. And uh, the main thing is to know whether an angle is open or closed. Sometimes to view certain areas of the retina, the periphery, you need to dilate and for that you need gonioscopy. And one very important thing is trauma. When your patient has a trauma, you must do a gonioscopy to see if there's any angle recession because there could be an angle recession which you could just miss if you do not do a gonioscopy. The contraindications are recurrent corneal er erosions. A patient with recurrent corneal erosions is difficult to do gonioscopy. Any kind of corneal abrasion would stop you from doing gonioscopy. Corneal keratopathy, some connective tissue disorders where it is difficult to do gonioscopy. And uh, certain uveitis, iritic conditions, those also make gonioscopy difficult. You cannot actually see the angle. And in trauma again, well, if you have a, a blunt trauma, it's difficult sometimes to do a gonioscopy. We move on to the Van Herrick method. Now, uh, the first thing that I want to impress out here, Van Herrick's method is important. When you're looking at the cornea, you need to see that the cornea is clear for you to do the gonioscopy. There's no corneal abrasion, etc. Then you do a Van Herrick's, but please do not take the Van Herrick's as the sign of the angle closure or open angle. It is absolutely no sign. It just gives you an indication of what you're seeing maybe, but to decide whether your patient has an angle open or a closed angle, you must do gonioscopy. So, Van Herrick's method, grade zero is iridocorneal contact. Grade one, I, I would be going through these uh, with the pictures with you. That is, grade one is peripheral AC depth, that is between iris, uh, iris and corneal endothelium, less than one fourth of the corneal thickness. Grade two is more than one fourth, but less than half. And grade three is equal to or more than half of the corneal thickness. And how do you do it? You make an optical section, 60 degrees between observation and illumination full slit beam, magnification approximately uh, 15x, low to medium illumination and place the optical section just inside the limbus, assuming the corneal thickness is equal to one unit, assess the width of the aqueous gap from the corneal endothelium to the iris. So there you are, here it is, that's the <coughs> Van Herrick. So if you see out there, this is the distance that we are talking about. The shadow that you see out here and the white thing, this is the distance we are talking about. That's the grade four, then you move on to grade three, and subsequently it becomes closed. And here, as you see, there's absolutely no gap that you can see. There is no gap, both of them, one is in opposition to the other. So when you get something like this absolutely closed, then of course you can more or less be sure, but even then you need to do gonioscopy. But in between these, you definitely need to do gonioscopy to make sure that the angle is open. So <coughs> the types of gonio lenses, we have the copy, the Richardson Schaeffer, the Leyden, the Barkin, 
Thorp and the Swan Jacob. So Thorp surgically uh, is a surgical and diagnostic lens, and the Swan Jacob is mostly used in children. That's the Copy lens for you, and the Barkin lens uh, to your right. The types of gonio prisms that we have, we have the Goldman single mirror with a single mirror inclined at 62 degrees, Goldman 3 mirror, we have the Zeiss 4 mirror, the Fosner 4 mirror, Sussman 4 mirror and the rich uh, trabeculoplasty lens that has 4 mirrors, 2 inclined at 59, 2 at 62 and then we have the Thorpe 4 mirror. For all practical purposes, it is desirable to do a gonioscopy with a 4 mirror lens because if you do not do it with a 4 mirror lens, you cannot do indentation gonioscopy which I am coming to just after this okay so these are the different types of lenses that you see the one that you see right there is the three mirror lens followed by that is the Zeiss with the handle four mirror and then you have the Sussman four mirror <coughs> then you have the comparative features of the mainly uh, used gonio prisms which I was just talking to you about so uh, the rest of the story is more or less fine for all of them but what you need to pay attention to is a about the coupling fluid that you need to use in these two lenses, you could do without it here. And what I was just telling you, indentation gonioscopy to make out if you know angle is an oppositional closure or it actually has a peripheral anterior sinic here, you've got to do an indentation or else there's no way that you can actually know that. So that is not possible with the others, you have to do it with a four mirror. So the technique of gonioscopy, direct gonioscopy, patient in supine position, topical or general anesthesia, gonio lens put over the cornea using the bridge of BSS, AT or HPMC and uh, gonioscope, you hold the gonioscope in one hand and uh, obviously the light <coughs> of the microscope with the other and you scan the 360 degrees of the angle and you have got to shift your own position to see the entire thing and that's the magnification. But what we mainly use is the indirect gonioscopy. At the office every day, this is what you use. You've got to anesthetize the cornea, surface anesthesia is required, proper positioning of the patient and the examiner, and uh, gonio prism placed with or without coupling fluid according to those lenses as I have shown you the classification. And uh, to hold the lens with two to three fingers, this actually needs a practical demonstration. But anyway, you must have seen someone doing a gonioscopy at some time when you've been in the OPD. Uh, so that's how a gonioscopy is done. And what you get is actually not like the uh, IO view, it's the mirror view that you get. It's not an inverted view, it's a mirror view that you get. That's the difference between the two. And uh, the angle is viewed in 180 degrees away from the mirror. Over the hill view, the view is over the convex iris and the dive bomber view that is patient looking in the direction of the mirror more deep angle recess can be seen and uh, or you have the cruise, uh, the cruise missile view where the patient to look away from the mirror view obtained parallel to the iris perpendicular to the trabecular meshwork that's the optimal image quality next we come on to the indentation or the compression gonioscopy it was described by Forbes and possibly uh, with the Zeiss mirror you have to use basically a four mirror in this to differentiate between sinical closure and appositional closure. So direct pressure on the cornea actually pushes the aqueous into the angle and appositional closure, it would open up actually with that. But if there is pass, then the cornea would be, it would be tethered to the cornea. So you cannot open it up. So that's the difference between the two. That's where you see it. The first one is where it is just placed. Second one is the indentation uh, gonioscopy where the angle doesn't open. So comparison between direct and indirect, This is these are actually uh, more or less uh, available in books and the internet. You could look it up. That's direct and indirect. You have the straight view of the angle, convenience with varied oppositional, narrow, better optics and light. And uh, uh, the main thing is the advantage of the direct is that it can be used in sedated patients or uh, children. And the indirect actually is difficult unless the patient cooperates disadvantages are also indentation gonioscopy is not possible the other one it's possible so this is actually uh, what I call a picture worth a thousand words because it's just a picture but it's really worth a thousand words because if you look at that just see out there that's the gonioscopic picture the ciliary body the scleral spur the trabecular meshwork and that's the Scholbe's line so this you must know at the tip of your fingers 
So, gonioscopic appearance of the normal angle, you just saw it there. I'll come to it once again with a better picture. I'll move on through this uh, for time. So, identifying the structure, ciliary body, one of the most easily notable structures as you see out there. Then comes the scleral spur, is simply a wedge of visible sclera and is the second structure to disappear as the angle narrows. Then you have the trabecular meshwork band. You actually have two parts of the trabecular meshwork, the anterior and the posterior. The Schalbez line, end of the decimus membrane of the cornea and is the most anterior structure in the angle and therefore the last structure to disappear as the angle narrows. And finally you have the Schlems canal, usually not seen, though often contains a pigment line or there could be blood in it when you can actually see it very clearly. So that's a histological picture out there of uh, the angle. But I'll move on to this, which I think uh, you need to have a look. If you look at the red, that's the open angle. Schalbe's line is the red arrow. Non-pigmented trabecular meshwork is the blue arrow. The white arrow is the trabecular meshwork. Uh, and then you have the Schlems canal and the, uh, the yellow arrow is the Schlems canal and the scleral spur that comes out here. Schlems canal cannot be seen with the scleral spur. And finally, you have the ciliary body, that's the green arrow. So you should be able to identify these structures when you do a gonioscopy. If you look at that, it's a prominent anterior uh, Schalbe's line and that's the Sampolis's line, which you see out there. You can see it in pseudo exfoliation. <coughs> Sampolis's line, blue arrow, these again, ac according to the arrows, you can see all of them in an open angle as it is here. There is a time constraint, so I'm actually a little bit rushing through this entire thing. But uh, anyway, trabecular meshwork, trabecular meshwork, you, could, uh, you should actually, is the structure, it is the most important structure for you to see, to call an angle open. You must be able to see the trabecular meshwork if you are to call that angle open. And it has two parts, an anterior part and a posterior part, which is uh, pigmented and non-pigmented, functional and non-functional. Then you have the scleral spur. You see those uh, yellow arrows out there. That is the scleral spur out here. It's seen clearly. Sometimes it might not be uh, visible very clearly when you have this kind of uh, insertions, the iris processes over it. That's excessive pigmentation where the scleral spur is not visible. Then you have the ciliary body band. The ciliary body band is here. The iris processes, as you see out there, these are the iris processes out here. Pigment distribution along the Schalbe's line constitutes the Sampolis's line, which we just uh, spoke about. Then you have the Schlems canal can be visualized as a red continuous line, or here you can see it clearly. Then you have normal vessels actually never cross. They do not cross the scleral spur, but uh, sometimes you can see these big vessels that are there. Then you have the circumferential normal vessels, but they never cross over these. Sheffer's grading. Sheffer's grading is uh, grade 4 is where you can see the ciliary body. Grade 3, you can see the scleral spur. Grade 3 and 2 is the trabecular meshwork. Grade 1 is the Schalbe's line and then when no angle structures are seen, obviously it's grade 0 and the angle is closed. So that's grade 1, that's grade 0 where you can't see anything and then we move on to grade 2. So that's grade 3 and grade 4. Then we have the Shee's grading system. The Shee's grading system is basically more or less just the opposite. Uh, grade 0 angle is a wide open angle. And that's how it is graded, as you see from here. This is, it starts from here, and then it goes like that. And you have the spathe classification, which is according to the iris insertion. I won't go into the details because of the time constraint. It's according to the level of insertion of the iris. That's the spathe classification. And I'll move through these. And uh, in infants, you do it with the swan jacob lens, I just told you. and. Uh, that's the axenfeld riger syndrome. There are certain syndromes which you must know when you're doing gonioscopy, actually, because uh, there would be a clear picture. Otherwise, you would not be able to recognize them. So you have the anteriorly displaced Schalbe's line, 
Thus, the posterior embryotoxin, then the tissue strands in the anterior chamber angle, similar in color and texture to the iris, open angle, and the scleral spur is covered by the iris insertion. You have the pseudo exfoliation syndrome where you can see out there the deposition of those clumps out there. That's the pseudo exfoliation syndrome. And you have the pigment dispersion syndrome, the PDS, where you uh, can. Can you see those the pigments out there? This is a gonioscopic picture. Post traumatic, you can actually see blood in the angle if there is a. And then you can see angle recession out here my dresses and you can see the lens matter peeping out iridodialysis that picture shows you can recognize it then you have angle closure look at that angle it's absolutely closed you cannot see any of the structures out there then you have the ice syndrome that is the channeless syndrome and you have the iris nevi and progressive iris atrophy that's a very typical picture Uveitic glaucoma, where you have the anterior synechia adherent to the Scholbe's line that you see out there. That's an haptic of the IOL. And uh, neovascular glaucoma, where you can actually see new vessels in the angle. And post surgical evaluation, these are the things supposing there has been a cataract uh, occluding the iridectomy, then post trabeculectomy. And following vitrectomy surgery, that's where you see the silicon oil and that's the anterior segment OCT but we generally rely on golioscopy as the gold standard of treatment UBM just one thing I'll show you out here is the sine wave sign that's the double hump that you can see it's very useful in the plateau iris syndrome so if you're not doing gonioscopy you're like the blind uh, men and the elephant you'd mistake the tail for the horn and the horn for the uh, years. So please do gonioscopy before you start any kind of anti-glaucoma treatment for your patient. And that's an invitation for the next glaucoma in the picturesque city of Palampur. Thank you very much for your attention.